Guys, gals, and non-binary pals, welcome back to Rhyme Signatures, where I'm going to be taking a little bit of a break from doing my usual nonsense of talking about brand new releases, because I want to talk about something that's a little bit different for me. Now, those of you who've been watching my channel for a while will know that my brand, as it were, is a lot more on the whole metal side of things, you know, your death metals, black metals, scary metals, lots of things that go arg, basically. But my roots also lie in classic progressive rock, and that is something that I've not talked a great deal about on this channel, and I kind of want to redress that now, and I want to tell you, talk to you, and discuss with you what I feel are my personal favourite 10 picks of the great era, back when prog was new, prog was king, and prog was considered one of the leading genres in the music market at the time. It was big money, you know, some of these albums made big, big money. So. Yeah, we're going to get into this pretty quickly, I think. I don't want to spend too much time beating around the bush here. So don't expect anything wild or really obscure from this list because it's not as much my wheelhouse as, you know, the metal side of things. But I do have a couple of maybe odd picks, maybe some notable exclusions that you might be thinking, hang on a minute, what's he talking about? But do remember that this isn't my bread and butter. This is the outlying genre for me. So... With that in mind, let's get cracking at number 10. First up, it's a band that I genuinely don't really understand that much, but I do love this album. It's Tarkus by Emerson, Lake and Palmer. Yeah, I went on a bit of a thing on a video earlier about, you know, the prog bands I just don't get, and ELP was on that list, and I still stand by that. But that doesn't mean to say that I can't appreciate the band for the bits that I do love, and I love Tarkus. Now, I found Tarkus in a bit of a roundabout way. Big Dream Theatre nut, as some of you probably do know. And it was Jordan Rudess's cover of Tarkus off his Road Home, I think it's called, album or something like that. He did a bunch of covers. And he covered Tarkus on it. And I absolutely loved it. And I was like, yo, what is this? I've got to listen to the original. Because this is rocking my mind right now. So I checked it out. I found the, uh, the, the the Death Armadillo, whatever you want to call this thing, which I still think is one of the greatest album covers of all time. It's ridiculous and I love it. And yeah, I adore this album. I think it's brilliant. I think it's one of the coolest epics I've ever heard. I really, really can't describe it with words very well. It's something you've got to listen to. Those who know will know, and those who don't know, do go and check it out. Just approach it with an open mind. Expect the strange, expect the unusual and the weird, and you'll probably have a great time with this. Okay, at number nine, we've got Camel with The Snow Goose. I wasn't sure if I wanted to go with this, Mirage, Moon Madness, I wasn't sure. Any of them would be valid, but this is probably the one I've listened to the most out of all of the classic Camel records. And for a lot of instrumental bands, I tend to find that I don't gel with it that well. I find it difficult, I find it... Hard to get into it when there's not that human connection from vocals, you know. I find it difficult. But Camel say more without words than I think they ever could with words. This is such a communicative album. It's so interesting. There's never a single moment on this I find tedious or boring. There's never a moment I feel unengaged with the record. I love it wholeheartedly. I think it's a brilliant piece of work. If you've never listened to Camel before, probably a good place to start. Maybe start with Moon Madness, maybe start with... Do you know what, honestly? Just have a look on Prog Archives, check out their classic era and pick one. You'll probably have a great time with it, but I would still definitely point to The Snow Goose as my favourite Camel record. Right, at number eight, this low down in the list is probably going to cause some controversy, some upset, I don't know, as well as the inclusion of what album I've chosen from this band, because I'm having a one album per band rule on this. It is The Yes Album by Yes. Yeah, we're not going for Close to the Edge. We're not going for Fragile, we're not going for Tales of Topographic Oceans, as much as I know Scott from the Prog Corner loves that album, I still have yet to figure it out. But this album, I figured out from day one, I love the Yes album, I think it is superb. Yours Is No Disgrace is one of the coolest opening tracks I've heard to any album ever. I love everything on this record, I find this is just such a fun album. For as weird as Yes are as a band, for as impenetrable a genre as prog can be, I do find that the Yes album is surprisingly accessible. You know, you've got some big tracks on here. There's not a lot of things which really dip to the low parts. Although tracks like The Clap are just so much endless fun. I mean, I challenge you to sit still during that guitar work. It's so, so bouncy, so much fun, so ingenious and creative. 
The whole record just sings to me from such a personal level. This was the first Yes album I remember actively exploring, and I've never lost the love for it. I adore this. I think this is a wonderful piece, and I would probably call this my favourite Yes album, you know, just hands down in general. I think it's genius. Love this record. Okay, and at number seven, what favourite progressive rock albums list would be complete without Screaming Face Man by King Crimson? Look, all joking aside, and it is often considered the most basic bitch thing on the planet to have this on any kind of list whatsoever, there is a reason why this consistently features in people's favourite albums of all time list. It's brilliant. It is a genius statement. It's debatable as to what really kick-started the progressive rock genre. Some people might point to Days of Future Past by the Moody Blues. A lot of people will point to this. Whatever argument you want to make, this is an absolutely stellar piece of work. There is nothing quite like it, even to this day, even after all the many imitators, all the people who sort of like took inspiration from King Crimson. This is one of the strongest debut albums of all time. It really is responsible for so much that's happened since it came out. And I can listen to this over and over and over again and never get bored. Epitaph, I think, is one of the strongest King Crimson songs ever written. Hell, I'd go as far as saying it's one of the strongest songs ever written. You know, not just King Crimson. We're talking across the board here. I love it wholeheartedly. I cannot sing enough praises of this album. It's iconic to look at. It's iconic to listen to. It's a brilliant record. But it's still fairly low down on this list. But this is my list, you know. Okay, at number six, we're going to Canada. We're going with Rush, 2112. Now, I was debating whether or not I wanted to include either Hemispheres, A Farewell to Kings, maybe Moving Pictures, that kind of stuff on here, but ultimately I've gone for 2112. Now, I know people will sometimes take umbrage with this as being included like really high up on the list of albums, because let's be real, it's a great first side, but nobody really talks about the second side, do they? You know, the tracks like Passage to Bangkok, Twilight Zone, Lessons, Tears, Something for Nothing, they're great songs. They are good songs, okay? I wouldn't say they were exceptional songs, but I think it's the strength of the first side, the strength of 2112 itself, that really propels this into the upper echelons for me. And I listened to this album a heck of a lot when I was growing up. I was obsessed. Every single nuanced detail of that first opening epic is just unbelievable. There is nothing else quite like it to me. It is one of the greatest progressive rock epics probably ever told. I love this whole dystopian future where music is illegal, which seems to be cropping up all over the place these days. They did such an incredible job with this. And come on, look at those outfits. You don't want to hang out with these guys? They're pretty cool. Now, I'm not sure if I'd call 2112 the best Rush album, but it's certainly the one I've listened to the most, and certainly the one I use as a reference point for pretty much everything else. So for that reason alone, I kind of felt duty bound to include it on the list, and we're kind of getting to the midway point now, so what's coming up next? Right, number five, it's Jethro Tull, Thick as a Brick. Story time, kids. Let's go back in time to when little old Ian was about... How old would I have been? Ten, I think, maybe. My dad used to play this one a lot in the house, like a lot, a lot in the house. I got really, really familiar with it. And there was this one moment I remember when I was a little kid. He had this spinning on the platter. And <laughs> it was fairly early on into side one, and it got to the point where Ian Anderson had, like, got stuck on one of those weird vocal ticks that he does, and it started skipping, you know? So you just got this, uh, 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 just over and over and over and over again. And my dad says, Ian, go on, let's, like, you know, knock the needle, stop it from skipping. So being the incredibly intelligent young man that I was, <laughs> I kind of hit the dust cover with all my force that I could muster as a 10-year-old. <laughs> kind of not only broke the turntable but also kind of broke the record and I felt really bad about that you know uh, it took my dad a little while to forgive me as you can probably understand little me was a bit of an idiot when it came to that sort of thing I don't know what I was doing I was 10 years old for crying out loud but ever since then I've felt a slight I don't know guilt laden association with this record and it led to me listening to this an awful lot when I was a teenager it almost felt like I was seeking penance for my actions, you know, it was kind of weird. But what ended up happening is that rather than feeling the guilt that I once felt for destroying this record, I ended up developing a massive affinity for it. And I still to this day will maintain this is one of the greatest two-track albums ever made. You know, you've got your side A, side B. Kind of the whole deal back in the 70s, you know, prog rock, let's fill side one with one track and side two with another track. And for as much as this was a parody of the concept album, if anything, it made it sort of stand on its own merits within a sea of similar imitators. 
Now, I will always champion this as Jethro Tull's greatest work, even if it is up there with competition from the likes of Passion Play, Aqualong, Heavy Horses, all that sort of stuff, you know. But I think just from the personal association I have with this album and the history that it has with me and my sort of deep-seated memories, I love this album. I cannot get enough of it. I think it's brilliant. Number five. Okay, at number four, we've got a band that I didn't really discover until much, much later because I never really gave them that much time of day, even though I felt like I've kind of done them a disservice as a result. It's Genesis, selling England by the pound. Now, the hard bit of this list was deciding which of the classic era Genesis albums to go for, because my favourite song by Genesis is on Foxtrot, it's Supper's Ready, because I think that's just a genius, genius song. There's also a lot that you can say for the likes of Lamb Lies Down, Nursery Crime, Trick of the Tail. You know, there's a lot of great albums from Genesis. I mean, let's be real. The run from Trespass up to, say, I don't know, Wind and Wuthering, it's unbelievable. I cannot think of a single band who's had a more consistent run than Genesis. But ultimately, as a whole, taken as an entire unit, I feel that Selling England by the Pound is their strongest work. From the very opening moments of Dancing with the Moonlit Night, I know I'm in for a good time. Peter Gabriel's vocals on this are so, so expressive, so interesting, so unlike anything else out there, that I couldn't help but just be completely fascinated by the entire experience from start to finish. Now, I will happily say that this is the Genesis album I've listened to the most out of my time on this earth. It's the one I always come back to if I'm never sure which you know, which album I actually want to spin at any given moment. And it did give me a little bit of pain in my heart to not include Foxtrot on here just because the Supper's Ready, but that can give the honourable mention. That would have been second place had the rest of the album been as good as Supper's Ready. But it's the consistency of Selling England by the Pound that I love the most, because there's not a single track on here that I don't love. Battle of Epping Forest is incredible. Cinema Show, don't even get me started. Absolute genius work. Incredible album and only beaten by three. And speaking of three, at third place, it is Pink Floyd with Animals. Yeah, okay. Now, I know a lot of people get collectively very upset if you call Pink Floyd a progressive rock band because they're it's like, rah, they're not prog, they're this, that, the other. It's like, I, I, it doesn't matter, it doesn't care, okay? For the purposes of what I understand from the band, they're prog. And I can remember um, a long, long time ago, I, uh, I first listened to this record, and my introduction to Pink Floyd was an interesting one. We had this old VHS tape, and on that VHS tape, we had about 30 or 40 individual cartoons taped off the TV over the course of, I don't know how long, however long it was. But the first 20 minutes of this VHS was that animated segment from Pink Floyd's The Wall. And you've got to remember, when I was watching this tape, I was maybe seven or eight years old at most, if not younger than that. And to witness the... How shall I describe it with ways that won't get me demonetized? The anthropomorphic ball bag of the judge from the trial stomping around the screen just before we segue into Tom and Jerry. I don't know, maybe it explains a few things about me. I don't know, who knows? But I remember like my dad telling me about the band Pink Floyd when I was I was wondering, you know, where does this cartoon come from? And he would tell me about Pink Floyd. And then he would put on some of the records that they have. You know, he maybe listened to The Wall in full, which I still maintain to this day is grotesquely overrated, but whatever. But it was really when I became a teenager and I started digging more into Pink Floyd's back catalogue outside of, you know, Dark Side of the Moon, The Wall, Wish You Were Here, etc, etc, that I really sort of gravitated towards animals. There is something so delightfully cynical about the stark, harsh commentary on capitalism and working culture that the lyrics of this record provided. I'm not the biggest fan of Roger Waters in his current state, he's become a little bit old man yells at clouds, but I'm not going to try and deny the genius that he had in his early days as a lyricist for Pink Floyd. And honestly, I think this is a perfect album. It's really, really up there. I cannot fault a single moment of this record. Even the artwork's incredible with, you know, Battersea Power Station just rocking out there. I mean, they've turned it into bougie apartments now, which honestly look pretty incredible. But unless you've got like 20 million quid spare, you're never going to be able to afford to live here. But one of these days, maybe I'll get to live in the Pink Floyd Animals building when I become a multimillionaire from this. Unlikely, but you never know. But yeah, Pink Floyd's Animals, incredible record easily deserving of a top three spot. 
But we've got two more, and bearing in mind I'm doing no repeats from other bands, and we've had a lot of the big names gone already, haven't we? You know, Rush is gone, Genesis is gone, Jethro Tull, yes, you know, they're, they're all moved off to the side now, we can't have any more records from them, so what the heck have I got left in my top two? And number two, Jeff Wayne's musical version of War of the Worlds. I adore this, I love this so, so much. It's difficult for me to come with real words as to how much I love this record and how much it's affected me, my personality, my musical aptitude, everything like that. I obsessed over this record. This is another one that I listened to a lot when I was a kid. This is another one from my dad's collection, not this actual physical copy. This is um, one that I found on Discogs, but you know. There is something about this that is so special. I can quite vividly remember freaking out when I listened to this record, you know? That opening moment, that dun dun dun! You know, it's so good. It's so, so good. There is something to be said about this fusion of prog rock, orchestra, even disco that goes on on this album, because, you know, it's a product of its time. It's 1978, I think, was it 1978? Yeah, 78, I got it right, check me out. There's something about that fusion of genres that made this such a memorable experience, and the way they managed to get this creepy, unsettling atmosphere on tracks like Red Weed Part 1 and Part 2 is just unlike anything else. Obviously, this was the first concept album I actively remember enjoying. The narrative flow and structure of this is very deliberate, it's very in-your-face, there's very little left of the imagination, which you may or may not enjoy, but as a kid, I loved it. I could follow the story easily. And to this day, you know, H.G. Wells' like, War of the Worlds is one of the creepiest, most interesting sci-fi stories ever made, especially when you consider when it was written, you know? But the way that they've been able to really capture the spirit of H.G. Wells' vision within the music, to really give you that sense of scale, that sense of futility against the Martian invasion, has been captured so, so well on this work. Every single moment on this track is incredible, every single little nugget of everything just hit me so hard over the years, and I found out something kind of interesting about Forever Autumn the other day that I just want to share. Now this might be common knowledge, I don't know if it's not, but I only found out about it the other day. Turns out that the melody of that song was originally intended to be used in a Lego commercial, and then Jeff Wayne's like, Ah, screw that, I'm gonna put it on this record instead. So, I'm just trying to imagine what that might have sounded like. Maybe there's like demo versions out there that I don't know about. But a little bit of tidbit of information there for you. But yeah, Jeff Wayne's musical version of War of the Worlds, incredible record, such a huge part of my childhood, and one of the greatest progressive rock albums ever made. I will fight people on this. So, with all of that out of the way, we are left with only one thing left. Number one on the list. My choice for the greatest progressive rock album of the classic era. What could it possibly be? What have we missed? What have we not talked about? Who's not featured yet? Well, it can only be one man and one man alone. It is the inimitable Mike Oldfield and Omadorn. Oh, Omadorn. My God. I... <laughs> I'm, I'm struggling at the moment, you know. Here's me thinking, I'm going to get to number one, I'm going to talk to people about Almadorn, and I'm going to know exactly what I'm going to say. I'm freeballing this, you know, there's no script, I'm going from the heart on this. So maybe that's the way I should be talking about this one, from the heart. Almadorn changed me. It completely changed me. There is no other way to describe it. Everybody will go, oh, Tubular Bells this, Tubular Bells that, yada, 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 yada. And it's great, Tubular Bells is great. Almadorn is transformative. I have never in my life felt such an affinity, such a keen connection to an album, that, and I still do to this day. This has got to be what, like nearly 50 years old? I have no idea. Got to be close to that, right? I'm not sure when this came out. I can't remember off the top of my head. Obviously, I wasn't alive when it came out, but I am now. There is something so universal, something so comforting and incredible about Omadorn. The way it moves, the way it builds, the way it segues into these incredibly captivating sequences, one after the other. There's a little bit of vocals on here, you know, the sort of Omadorn or whatever it is, the, the chanting weird choral kind of pagan hippie vocals that go on halfway through the first side. Love that, by the way. Incredible. And something about the build-up and payoff after that, the drumming, the climaxing, the sort of crescendos. Oh my god, I love it so much. It's just unbelievable. And then just when you think you're, you know, you're done, side one calms down and it all sort of segues, you know, it's, it's done, you know, it's calm. 
Side two comes back in with this wall of sound, this big noise that keeps on going and going. Then you've got bagpipes coming in and it's all calm and serene and just this incredible sort of new age energy. And guess what? I even love the horse song at the end. I think it's brilliant. It's cute, it's kitsch, it's silly, and it's a lovely, pleasant way to sort of round off the album. Omodorn is a record I will take to my grave with me. I adore this. I will forever sing the virtues of this. I feel this is a better record than everything else I've talked about on this list. This is, for my money, the greatest progressive rock album of the classic era, and I will die on this hill. I love it. And so there you have it. That is my personal picks for the 10 greatest albums of the classic progressive rock era. I know I've missed out so many. I know I didn't have close to the edge at the top. Yada, yada, yada. Don't care. My list. Tell me about yours. Drop it in the comments below. I'd love to see where we differ. I'd love to see if you think I'm an idiot for including some of these on the list. You know, whatever. Let's go. Let's talk about it. Let's see what's happening. Talk to me about yours. And as always, guys, if you made it this far, thank you so very much for watching. And until next time, guys, keep your rhyme signatures pretty odd.